Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Roberto Corona. I am an Italian anthroposopher and astrologer and in this video we're going to talk about the next full moon in Aries on October 17. Now this moon still belongs to the lunation cycle of the last solar eclipse because it was a new moon and this full moon brings it to full manifestation. Now, as we will see, the full moon in Aries will try to drag us out of the eclipse season and all the issues we confronted the last two weeks, which on a global scale have been very, very intense. In this regard, we can count on Archangel Michael's help, the ruler of the autumn season, and as we will see, the archetype of the warrior is particularly appropriate in this chart because it involves both Mars and star Arcturus, which is a warrior star. So this is the chart of the full moon in Aries, but first of all, let's talk about the last changes in the sky because we have a couple of planets turning their motion. So specifically on October 9, Jupiter turns retrograde and on October 12, Pluto turns direct. And this means that as we approach this full moon on October 17, we're gonna have an emphasis on the forces brought about by these two planets, so Pluto and Jupiter. And basically Jupiter is gonna help us, whereas Pluto is gonna play the role of the main villain, so to speak. On top of that, uh, on October 14, Mercury enters Scorpio, and you can see Mercury here uh, that crossed the sign, right? So this is a full moon and we are reaching the peak, the culmination of the manifestation of the etheric forces on the earth. And as we mentioned, we are basically uh, reaching the culmination of this cosmic seed, the last new moon, which was the solar eclipse of October 2nd. So we're not completely out of eclipse season, but we're still there. But in general, this is a good moment because we're called for uh, making a retrospection, reviewing the past as the light is shed in darkness because this is what a full moon is doing. Now, this is a moment of awakening in general. And as we will see, um, this moon will lead us to remedy the situations brought about the eclipse season. So this is good. So uh, on the positive side, we can add that it is a time for awareness, revelations, liberation, release, and also purification. Now, the gestation of new impulses begins too, and we will sown them on the next new moon in Scorpio on November 1st, and we're going to talk about that in relation to the Festival of the Dead, by the way. So let's take a look at the chart. The moon is here at 14, sorry, 24, 35 degrees Aries in the starry image of Pisces. And the sun is, of course, in the opposite, 24 degrees Libra. And what's interesting about the sun is that the sun is in close conjunction with not one, but two very important stars, Spica or Spica in Latin, the ear of wheat, that the starry Virgo is holding in her hand and you can see, uh, see it here, right? And the other star is star Arcturus, the guardian of the bear, a warrior star that, as we will see, fits very well in the overall meanings of the chart. Now, the full moon is in Aries, right? And this means that it is ruled by Mars, Lord of Aries. But Mars is in Cancer. And this is good because usually Mars in Cancer is in detriment. However, this time we can count on the mutual reception that Mars is doing with the Moon. So what's a mutual reception? Basically, the planets are receiving each other in each other's domicile. So the Moon, Lady of Cancer, receives Mars in her domicile, which is... Um, uh, Cancer, right? And Mars, Lord of Aries, is receiving the moon in his. Now, this means that the moon and Mars are sort of teaming up in this chart, working together very, very well. Now, this is important because 
a mutual recep a reception completely mitigates and also change the signification of the hard aspect between the, the Moon and Mars, which is a square. And on top of that, as you can see, Mars is making a square with the Sun too. So it is a good thing that we have the, the ruler of the full Moon and the Moon herself in mutual reception here, right? Now, this square generates uh, great tension, great energy, great dynamism in the chart. However, it will be turned to a good purpose by the collaboration between Mars and the Moon. So it is still a square, but we can make good use of that. Now, we mentioned the change of direction of both Pluto and Jupiter. So what are they doing? This is interesting because basically um, they are affecting, they are both affecting the chart, but in two completely opposite ways. On the one hand, Jupiter closes, so to speak, the luminaries in a so-called Thales triangle. So basically Jupiter is here and Jupiter is making a trine with the Sun and a sextile with the Moon, uh, two good aspects. So it's sort of creating this harmony in the chart. On the other hand, Pluto, uh, which remember, Pluto is still in Capricorn and it is changing direction to get back into Aquarius. Pluto is making a T-square with the two luminaries. And of course, this is bad, right? Overall, we could also speak of a mild grand cardinal cross. Um, I am referring to the cross formed by the luminaries, Mars and Pluto in cardinal signs. This is why we call it uh, a grand cardinal cross. So we have the cross formed by Sun and Moon and by Mars and Pluto. Uh, it is mild though, because the aspects as a whole are not very, very close, uh, but definitely we can count on the two T-squares. So this chart is um, brings a lot of energy, but I do think that the mutual reception is going to make good use of it. So um, in a nutshell, regarding Jupiter and uh, Pluto, Jupiter helps, whereas Pluto complicates the situation. Also interesting noticing the position of Venus. Why Venus? Well, Venus, she is making a trine with the ruler of the chart and that's Mars. It is making a trine with Mars and uh, Venus, she is at 29 degrees Scorpio on the so-called anaretic degree. And this hints that something something is about to change soon because we have Venus in the last degree of Scorpio so it is about to change sign uh, and something is about to change especially in regards to re relational dynamics especially because we have discussed about it in the previous video and this is the full moon of the seed planted by the eclipse which of course was ruled by Venus so this is important something can change here right in particular, we can say that relationships will tend to improve because Venus is about to end her exile in Scorpio. Venus is pretty weak though, however, she's going to try to sweeten up Pluto through a sextile, as you can see, and she is forming a grand, um, a minor grand trine with Neptune. So it is a trine but it is called a minor grand trine because it is closed by another planet, by Pluto, with two sextiles. So this is a, another harmonious component in the chart. Let's now tackle the meanings of the chart. As always, I'm going to start from the physical meanings. Now, uh, full moon is all about revelations, but in this case, they are going to lead us to fighting. Uh, fighting, but in a good way. And this is because the Moon and Mars are in mutual reception and Mars is in Cancer. And Cancer is all about protection. So basically this Mars, this warrior, it is a guardian, it is a protector, it is a warrior fighting to protect the weak, children, the family, the homeland, all good uh, Cancer significations. And this is confirmed by the star Arcturus, which again is in conjunction with the Sun and it is called the Guardian of the Bear. So again, we have this Guardian 
archetype, right? So what's interesting about the star is that the star comes with both the natures of Mars and Jupiter. So again, we have the warrior in the very nature of the star represented by, Mar by Mars, but we also have justice represented by uh, the, the nature of Jupiter, right? So what is Jupiter doing in the chart? Again, Jupiter is making good aspects with both the sun and the moon, a trine and a sextile. And being the great benefic, it will bring about harmony. And of course, this is very, very good. So basically, the full moon brings to light dynamics of conflict. We cannot like mm, underestimate that but is going to try to resolve them with defensive strategies. And again, the key word is protection. And who's threatening us? Who's making like a mess in this chart? Of course, it is Pluto, which is again in Capricorn. And for this reason, it represents strong powers, powers, powers that belong to the Capricorn significations that are basically a representation of hierarchies in general, hierarchies of some kind, uh, you know, the chain of command in general, uh, at work or in governments and so on. So Pluto is intimidating us. It is making us feel exposed. And why is that? because Pluto is making a square with the moon. So with the uh, emotional component of the chart. So this brings us to the uh, psychological significations of the chart. And in fact, we could easily feel uh, under this full moon attacked, targeted, or even emotionally triggered by other people because of this square between Pluto and the moon. However, this is not necessarily bad because it can be a good opportunity, you know, to become more aware about what, what's threatening us, uh, taking actions, coping with all that and trying to, uh, you know, to respond somehow and to protect ourselves better, right? And talking about that, again, we can count on Jupiter for good communication skills in this regard. Why is that? Because Jupiter, of course, it is making these harmonious aspects and Jupiter is the planet of trust and it is in Gemini, the zodiac sign of communication. So we can count on good communication skills that Jupiter is offering to us. Now, relationship wise, remember that Venus is about to leave Scorpio. Venus, however, she is still in Scorpio. And this means that we are called to bring about change. We have to take responsibility about that. So it's on us, basically. It's not uh, in Sagittarius yet. We need to make her doing this, um, making this extra step, basically. In this regard, this warrior, this guardian can definitely set, uh, I would say, healthy personal boundaries, right? This is, a, in my opinion, a good way to interpret this guardian archetype here. So in relationships, I am setting healthy personal boundaries. I am protecting myself, right? So in general, uh, protection is the key word here. From a spiritual point of view, the moon is found in the starry image of Pisces down here. And in astrosophy, Pisces is the constellation of the Trinitarian principle of the father and the law of the father, which spiritually is the law of karma. Now, as always, the constellations gives us the uh, opportunity to use images, which is uh, very beautiful, in my opinion. In particular, the image of the new moon here is found close to the fish that is looking back. So basically, the constellation of Pisces is made of two fishes. One is leaping forward and one is looking back. And so the moon is uh, right on the fish that is looking back. And this is very, very compatible, if you think about it, with the general meaning of a full moon being a good moment for retrospective. So a retrospective, a spiritual retrospective about what in particular? We're talking about karma here and especially uh, a retrospective to understand 
what collective karma has been released by the eclipses. And here our attention goes immediately to the very delicate situation in the Middle East involving Israel, the Gaza Strip, Lebanon, and Iran, you name it, is a, a, a very, very delicate and complex situation that we need to understand better, right? Because part of the karma of humanity has been released, quite evidently, I would say. Now, as we've said before, uh, the guardian archetype is also confirmed on a spiritual level because of the star Arcturus. And who's Arcturus? Arcturus is King Arthur. Or if you prefer, uh, this star uh, is the star of the hero protecting the Virgin. And why the Virgin? Because the sun, which is in conjunction with the star, is precisely here in the starry image of the Virgin. And the image of the Virgin also holds in her hand an ear of wheat, which is the other star that we mentioned, the star Spica, Spica in conjunction with the sun, right? You can see it right here. Now, this is a very, very beautiful star. It is basically uh, an oval white star, an egg-shaped star, which is linked to the harvest, to abundance, and of course, to uh, wheat. And wheat is a solar cereal. Now, um, we have uh, seven cereals that are traditionally connected to the seven planets, and the cereal of the sun is wheat. Now, basically, the Virgin also comes with another image, which is the image of the Eucharist, because talking about wheat, uh, wheat is a symbol for bread. Now, the Virgin, more specifically, is holding in her hands two things. One, one hand corresponds to star Vindemiatrix, the grape harvester, which is a symbol for wine, and the other hand uh, in the other hand, we have spica, the ear of wheat, which is a symbol for bread. So we have both. We have bread and wine. We have the, the body and the blood of the earth, the body and bloody of Christ. And this is because according to anthroposophy, the Christ has become the very spirit of the earth. So after the mystery of Golgotha, the Christ from being a solar spirit penetrated into the earth, connecting himself with the earth becoming the spirit of the earth. And this is very important because in the, with this star, we have a reference to Christ and we can connect the picture of Christ to this warrior image. And who is the warrior image? Who's the warrior of Christ or the face of Christ? Of course, it's Archangel Michael who oversees the autumn season. And so I've started with the image of Michael, and I'd like to end this video with the image of Michael as well. As always, thanks for watching. If you want to support my work, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell not to miss out on future astrological insights. I am Roberto Corona. See you in the next video.